This episode today is extremely important because it is all about you and all about your money. <laughs> your money when it comes to buying audio. And it's about, well, the process about how we get there, how you get to decide what it is you're going to buy. And so and then sort of the follow-up to that is how to avoid costly mistakes. That is buying <laughs> the wrong thing. You definitely do not want to go there, right? So it's, it's sort of like a how-to in a way. Uh, just a bunch of ideas that I'm going to put together, put them on a little plate and serve them to you and say, here's, here's some things to think about as you're going about the process before you, you put your money down, before you put your credit card down or your PayPal, whatever. Things to think about before you buy any piece of well, it's expensive audio. Now, I just want to say this up front. I don't want to forget to mention this, that a lot of times I see people in the comments talking about buying something because they got such a great deal. Like, oh, it was amazing. It was half off or some incredible discount. And that's why you pulled the trigger. And that certainly has its valid <laughs> validity to it. But that shouldn't be the primary thing. And sometimes it is like, I'm not that interested in this thing, but it's such a good deal. I said, what the hell? I'm going to buy it anyway. Yeah, that could work out but it might not and it might have been like instead of going for the thing that you really want instead instead of getting that one you got the thing that you got the better deal on and if that works for you good but the chances are and again i want to hear about this in the comments about buying things because you got a deal and then it turned out to be not such a deal after all but anyway because it can be for some of us a scary proposition we're going to spend potentially a lot of money and we could go it could go terribly wrong. That's the fear. That's the little voice in the back of your head saying, no, 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 don't do this. It's a big mistake. It's, you're going to hate it. All sorts of reasons to say no, not to do it. And it's sort of an obstacle course to overcome that. And again, that's the kind of thing I want to hear from you, how you do it. Now, here's some words of advice that uh, <laughs> you can disregard at your own risk. Before you buy an expensive product, Consider what it's going to be like when you try to sell that product. You've spent your time with it, whether it's a year or two years or three years or four, and now it's time to move on. How easy is it to sell that product? In other words, how much of its value holds up over time? Some companies will, it will plummet like a rock. Some more known brands will hold their value much longer. And the only way to know that for sure is to look around and see what they're, what this company's products are selling for used. Please, please do that. And then another thing I want you to think about is service for that product. In other words, how easy is it to get service from a given company? How long is their warranty? Again, if it's a, it's a lot of money, you should try contacting the company by email, see how responsive they are. Uh, you know, plan ahead is what I'm saying. If you're buying a product made in another country, do they have service in your country? Or will you have to return it to the country where it's being manufactured? <laughs> oh my, yes, there will be an Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. And here's a sneak peek of what's coming up. How do people buy audio nowadays? I think, well, reviews <laughs> play a, a large role in this, right? Uh, some people just tell me if, a product X has a lot of really positive reviews and it's something that they're interested in, that that's enough to do it. But I think, I think there's other ways that people do it. I think if you hear a product at a show, that could be very significant. Even better, if you talk to the designer or the person who owns the company at the show and you had a good feeling about that conversation and you like the sound that you heard in the show, that could be a big part of it. I really think that that plays a role because it, it provides a human dimension to this, to this thing that you're going to buy. It's not just a box. It's made and was con conceived of by a human being who was really passionate about making great audio. So there is that. I'm really sure it plays a role. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a dealer that's nearby or close enough and you get to pick their brain and do comparisons with other similarly priced products 
And that leads to confidence in terms of making the decision to buy the thing. In some ways, that's the best way to go because you've heard it. And not only have you heard it, you've heard it compared to other similarly priced things or maybe more expensive things or maybe even less expensive things. That is huge in terms of getting that confidence to do it. Now, I did, you, many of you know, I was a hi-fi salesman for 16 or 17 years and I was part of that process because I was doing demos, thousands and thousands of demos comparing stuff and talking about audio and having people pick my brain. And I gotta say, for almost the entire time I did it, I really, really, really enjoyed helping people because I'm sort of doing that now, but it's not a one-on-one -on -one thing anymore, which kind of makes me sad. But in any case, that one-on-one -on -one thing I had with people about how it would fit into their lifestyle, how it would fit in their, in this case, their apartment if they lived in New York City, that was huge. And how their wife or a significant other felt about the product that they were gonna buy was also uh, <laughs> something to be considered. Uh, there was a lot, a lot going on. And they got to bring in their own music and hear it themselves. It was, I just love the experience. Now the other thing that I have to talk about is in my years selling audio, I watched a lot of my customers struggle with making that decision. I witnessed it right in front of my face thousands and thousands of times because it's hard. It's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of, brings up a lot of insecurities about am I buying the right thing or what if happens if I buy the wrong thing. <laughs> so yeah, I, I feel it. I was very empathetic with my customers because I, I really understood what they were going through and I did my best to make them feel comfortable doing it, you know, pulling the trigger and buying that thing. You know, I can't put a number on it, but for the most part, I really felt like it all worked out because a lot of my customers came back and a lot of my customers came back with a friend that was interested in buying something and said, hey, you can trust Steve. That's why my word uh, was important because if I misled people just to make a sale, they would say, screw that guy, Guttenberg. He, no, but if they came back again and again with to buy more and to turn on somebody else to it. Yeah, that was, that was the cherry on top for me. So, you know, another aspect of this is, well, people don't talk about it enough in reviews, but I try to, is how the thing looks. How does it feel when you touch it? Because when I was a salesman, I witnessed that firsthand, that people would run their hands over the speaker cabinet, they'd wrap their knuckles against it, they get, got a sense of its heft or its solidity, and with uh, preamplifiers and receivers, they turn the volume control, they flip the switches, because all of that stuff, which is what I call knob feel, is part of the experience, part of the thing of living with the product and having a satisfying, let's say, relationship with the things that you buy, is that you feel good about them, and yeah, you're gonna live with this stuff. How does it look, how will it look in your living space, in your living room or listening room or whatever room you're gonna put it in, because you're going to be staring at the thing for hopefully for years, will that wear well over time? Again, should be part of the decision process. So if you look at something and you just like are knocked out by the way it looks, it's like love at first sight. Don't rush too quick, but if you think that just the joy of living with something that has that kind of quality or that look that you really are, you know, love, that's not a small thing, as opposed to buying something that you're not so crazy about the way it looks. Or you might even find that, well, it sounds really good. It's gotten rave reviews, but I think it's kind of ugly. Mm, that might be a turnoff as you live with the thing over time, or you might get used to it and you don't even think about the way it looks anymore. It could go either way. I'm just saying it should be part of the processes to make what makes you pull the trigger or not on a given product. So what this really comes down to is, how do you pick the right one, the right one for you? I don't care how many rave reviews it's got. That's not, that's not the main point here. The right one for you, meaning for your room, with your placement issues, if it's a pair of speakers, uh, with the kind of music that you listen to, how loud you listen, is it, does it look right for you? All of these things and many more uh, variables, do they work for your situation? That is the thing, and sound good to you, right? It, all of those things have to align to some degree, the more the better, to make this the right decision. And any big obstacle in the way, 
mm, should be something you back away from because it's not you're not going to be happy over the long term with this thing <laughs> the speaker this amplifier whatever this turntable you know if, if when in doubt slow down don't do it in a rush take your time now I've learned over the years that I've had this YouTube channel that a lot of you guys buy and keep a lot of stuff. You don't just buy a pair of speakers, then when it's time for them to go sell them, buy the next one. Some of you just keep buying more stuff and you don't care about selling it or what to do with it. You just amass a vast amount of audio and that's cool. But um, if that's not you and you do want to get in and get out, uh, think. Think before you jump. Very, very important. And now we're going to do it. We're going to do the Audiophiliac viewer system of the day, and there will be a bunch. So stick around, and I will see you back again on the other side of this uh, parade of incredible audio. This is Jeff's system. He lives in Santa Rosa, California. His turntable is a Riga Planer 8, and the cartridge is an Amphetta 3. Phono stage, Chord Huel. Streamer, Blue Sound Vault. The DAC is a Chord Dave preamp, Macintosh C70. The amplifiers, there's two of them, are twin Macintosh MC275s vertically biamping the speakers, which are Fine Audio F703, subwoofer JL Audio E110. Cabling is by Wireworld. And the power conditioner is a Furman Elite 15 PFI. Thank you, Jeff. This is Andrew's system. He lives in Melbourne, Australia, and he is 58 years old. Those big speakers are NOLA Metro Grand Reference. The turntable is a Lin Sondek LP12 with an Ecos SE Arm, candid cartridge, and a Lingo power supply. Preamp. Uh, the phone preamp is an Audio Research PH6. Uh, there's an Esoteric K01X SACD player, Esoteric G1 clock. The preamp is a Thrax. The power amp is also Thrax. And power conditioners are by Sunyata. Thank you, Andrew. This is Carlton's system. <laughs> as soon as I saw those speakers, I thought, whoa. Those are Apogee Scintilla full-range ribbon speakers, and they are wired for one ohm operation. So the amplifiers have to be pretty darn serious, and they are VTV High Power Purify Monoblox. Then there's a Revis Audio PARC. I think that's the preamp. Then there's a Cambridge CXN that's being shipped out to ModRite for a tube output stage modification. For music, it's Rune Cobas controlled by a scenic Mamanides controller. Thank you, Carlton. This is Danny's small Brooklyn apartment living room system. He has a Rune server running on MacBook. Streamer is a ropey Rune client feeding the DAC via USB. The DAC itself is a Bell Canto 2.5. It's actually sideways in the picture there. Uh, the amp, Deckware Select Zen Triode. The speakers are Zoo Druid Credenzas. Thank you, Danny. This is Ronnie's upstairs bedroom system. He has a MyTech Liberty DAC with the SB Booster power supply, and that runs through a Linear Tube Audio Microzotal M23 preamp. Uh, then we see a pair of Quicksilver Horn mono amplifiers with either EO34 or KT88 output tubes. The speakers are DIY open baffles from Teakwood, by the way, with 12-inch vintage Alnico Zenith drivers that were made in 1963. For bass, Ronnie has a set of RHEL TX7s that are coming in at 60 hertz. For vinyl playback, there's a Vintage Techniques SLD2 with a new HANA EH moving coil cartridge. This is what Christopher's system looks like. I think it's cool. Uh, the speakers are Bowers and Wilkins CM4s with soft dome tweeters. The sub 
is a Yamo slim profile facing the floor and it's sitting on 3D printed feet that Christopher made in his dental lab. The receiver is a Sony 725W and the music source is an iPhone with the title app. The red desk is custom painted by Christopher's mother. <laughs> nice go. Thanks, Christopher. We are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg and it's true. I am the audiophiliac and I just want to mention that Herb, my friend Herb Reichert has been a frequent guest on the show and I can't explain why, but I never put together a Herb playlist until now. So it's, if you want to have a Herb marathon, it's not that many, but if you want to have a Herb marathon, now it's easier than ever to do that. And Herb's going to be, I think, a more regular guest on the show. Uh, but here's the thing. If you really like the show and you like these appearances with Herb and other interviews that I do and the Audiophiliac Viewer Systems of the Day and all the reviews I do and thought pieces, would you please consider contributing to my Patreon? It is super easy to do. The address is on the screen. You can join for a couple of bucks a month, up to 50 or 100. Patreon accepts payments in dollars, pounds, euros, and other currencies. And uh, anyway, think about it, check out the site, and uh, whatever, whatever works for you. And uh, if you like a video, please hit that like button. It's very important to the YouTube algorithm. And if you have yet to subscribe to the channel, please do so as we are slowly, ever so slowly, inching my way and our way to 250,000 subscribers. Wow. Anyway, I, literally I couldn't have done it without you guys. And with that, I can say my work here is at last complete. Thank you so much for watching. And I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.